Beneath the busy streets of Sydney, a silent giant sleeps. What was once meant to be one of Australia's most important infrastructure projects now sits unfinished and uncertain. This is the M6 motorway, a $3.1 billion megatunnel that was supposed to change how Sydney moves forever. Stick with me as we explore the four big mistakes that sunk Sydney's $3 billion M6 motorway tunnel. For decades, people living in Sydney's southern suburbs have dreamed of an easier way to reach the city. Every morning and evening, traffic piles up on the Prince's Highway. Commuters spend hours every week just waiting for the line to move. As a result, the M6 motorway was designed to fix that problem. The plan was to build two tunnels, each four kilometers long, running deep beneath the suburbs of Arncliffe, Rockdale, and Cogra. Once finished, the M6 would link directly to the M8 motorway, giving drivers a faster, smoother route straight into the city. To many, it wasn't just another road, it was a lifeline. But what looked like a simple connection on a map would soon reveal a far more complicated story beneath the surface. The dream of a southern motorway isn't new. It actually began more than 70 years ago. Back in 1951, city planners set aside a narrow strip of land for what was then called the F6 extension. It was a grand vision for the future, meant to stretch from the city all the way to the southern coast. However, that dream never came true, even after so many years. The line remained only a faint mark on city maps. It wasn't until the mid-2000s that things finally began to move again. Sydney's traffic problem was getting worse, and the government was under pressure to deliver new roads. Around that time, the F6 extension plan was brought back, but with a new name and a modern twist. Instead of calling it F6, it would be part of a bigger project known as the M6 motorway. Apparently, it is just stage one of Australia's massive road construction projects, and comprises four kilometers of twin tunnels connecting the M8 motorway at Arncliffe to President Avenue at Cogra. In 2019, the project received its final approval. It was declared a piece of critical state-significant infrastructure. The government wanted it built fast, and by 2021, a design and construct contract was signed with a major construction joint venture. Building a tunnel under a major city is never simple. Engineers had to carve two long, curving tubes deep underground, each wide enough for three lanes of traffic, all while avoiding water pipes, train lines, and the foundations of hundreds of buildings above. To make it possible, the tunnels had to plunge nearly 90 meters below the surface at their deepest point. Following the approval of the M6 motorway project, the government went with what's called a Design and Construct DNC, contract, a system meant to save time, but one that would soon prove dangerously costly. This meant that the contractor wasn't just responsible for building the tunnel, they were also responsible for designing it. On paper, this made sense, and it promised faster delivery and fewer arguments between designers and builders. But in reality, it shifted enormous risk onto the contractor. The contractor's engineers carried out ground studies and surveys before digging began, but no amount of scanning or sampling could fully reveal what was waiting 90 meters below Sydney's surface. The deeper they went, the more unpredictable the terrain became. Apparently, Sydney sits on layers that look simple on paper, but tell a very different story beneath the surface. The upper crust of the city is dominated by Hawkesbury Sandstone, a golden, fine-grained rock that's been the backbone of Sydney's skyline for more than a century. Builders love it because it's strong, predictable, and stable, perfect for carving tunnels, supporting skyscrapers, and laying solid foundations. For much of Sydney's underground infrastructure, this sandstone has behaved beautifully, but the M6 didn't stay in that ideal layer. As the planned twin tunnels stretched south from Arncliffe toward Cogra, the geology began to change dramatically. With the complexity of Australia's geological zones, the project contractors had to carefully choose the best tunneling machine to be deployed for this project. Apparently, they were left with only two main options, 
The first was to use giant tunnel boring machines, which are massive circular drills that chew through the earth like mechanical worms, building the tunnel's concrete lining as they go. And the second option was to use a more flexible tool called the road header. But the M6 wasn't a simple tunnel. It needed complex shapes, wider caverns, and multiple connections for ventilation, ramps, and future extensions. So instead of TBMS, the contractors chose to utilize the road header. It's slower than a TBM, but far more adaptable, especially in variable ground. Up to 10 of these machines were planned to operate underground, each carving a few dozen meters of tunnel per week. For months, the road headers ground forward through Sydney's deep layers, their cutter heads roaring day and night beneath the suburbs. At first, progress seemed unstoppable. The sandstone behaved as expected, firm, dry, and steady. But as the machines pushed south toward Rockdale, the sandstone grew patchy, broken by seams of soft clay, loose sand, and waterlogged soil. Engineers monitoring the ground movement noticed early signs of instability, tiny shifts in pressure readings, rising moisture levels, and more vibration than usual in certain stretches. This zone, known as mixed ground, required a completely different tunneling approach. Instead of slicing smoothly through hard rock, the road headers were now cutting into materials that collapsed almost as soon as they were exposed. To fight back, the contractors turned to an emergency technique called jet grouting, a process that involves drilling narrow holes into the soft ground and injecting a cement-based slurry under high pressure. The idea was to solidify the weak soil before excavation continued. What began as minor instability soon grew into something far more dangerous. And by March 2024, deep beneath the suburb of Rockdale, above one of the tunnel alignments, a massive sinkhole, more than 10 meters wide, suddenly opened up in an industrial estate. The earth collapsed so violently that it tore the foundations from under a two-story office building, leaving it partially destroyed. For the first time, the project that had been pushing forward non-stop came to an abrupt halt. Then, just days later, it happened again. A second sinkhole appeared, barely 150 meters away from the first, confirming everyone's worst fears. When engineers began examining the collapse zone, what they found shocked them. The tunnel hadn't just passed through soft ground. It had intersected a high-angle reverse fault, a geological fracture unlike anything ever recorded in the Sydney Basin. The contractor claimed that the disaster wasn't due to negligence or poor design. It was an act of nature that made the project impossible to continue safely. But government officials weren't convinced. They pointed out that under the design and construct contract, the responsibility for understanding and managing geological risk fell on the contractor. Whether the fault was known or not, it was their job to design for the possibility of such surprises. This disagreement turned what began as a technical problem into a legal war. The story of Sydney's M6 motorway tunnel turned from an engineering marvel to a billion dollar headache because of four major mistakes, each one feeding into the next. The first mistake began at the drawing board, underestimating geological risk. On paper, the tunneling route looked straightforward, cutting through Sydney's familiar sandstone layers, but the underground world isn't uniform. The second mistake was baked into the very foundation of the contract. It sounded efficient, one team, one design, one delivery plan. But it also meant that when the unexpected happened, the financial and technical responsibility landed squarely on the builder's shoulders. What should have been a partnership turned into a blame game. The third mistake was technical. Engineers chose tunneling methods suited for strong rock, not for the unstable, vaulted ground they eventually hit. The use of road headers and traditional support systems worked well through solid sandstone, but struggled in soft, fractured zones. As the ground conditions worsened, crews scrambled to stabilize the tunnel walls using emergency jet grouting and extra reinforcement. Each patch-up slowed progress and drove costs higher. 
The fourth and final mistake came when the crisis hit, a breakdown in communication and accountability. As sinkholes opened and work stopped, both the government and the contractor pointed fingers. In the end, the price wasn't just measured in dollars, but in time lost, trust eroded, and a project's reputation shattered. The aftermath of the M6 disaster has left Sydney asking hard questions. The original 2025 completion target has slipped past 2028, with new cost projections climbing far beyond the initial $3 billion price tag. Let's hope Sydney's $3 billion M6 motorway tunnel will be completed and save citizens from tedious traffic. Until next time.